we're now going to look at some of the common terms that are used in studying current electricity and electric current. The first term that we need to know about is electric charge. Now, in chemistry classes, students study electric charge and they give the charges of atoms as positive 1 or negative 2, positive 3, negative 1. Whenever you give a charge as a positive 1 or 2 or negative 1 or 2, you're really saying how many electrons worth of charge that atom has. So positive 1 means you lost one electron, so it has one unit of positive charge. That unit where we give a charge of 1 to each electron or proton isn't convenient when we're studying current electricity in physics. We need another term. And the term that we use is the Coulomb, the Coulomb of charge. The Coulomb of charge is the total amount of charge of a whole bunch of electrons put together. One Coulomb of charge is the charge on 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons, if it's a negative Coulomb of charge. Or if it's a positive Coulomb of charge, it would be the charge on 6.25 times 10 to the 18th protons. Now, that's an awful lot of electrons to get one Coulomb of negative charge. 10 to the 18th is 10 to the 9th times 10 to the 9th. That's a billion billion. This is 6.25 billion billion electrons. So it takes a lot of electrons put together to make up one Coulomb of charge. And you might think, wow, that's too many. Well, think about Avogadro's number. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. 10 to the 23rd is 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 18th. 10 to the 5th is 100,000. So in a small amount of metal, when you have Avogadro's number worth of electrons and maybe 50 or 80 times that many or at atoms and 50 or 80 times that many electrons, this is a small fraction of what's there, but it is an awfully large number. It's more convenient in our studies of electricity. Just like you don't buy gasoline by the drop, you buy it by the gallon, and a gallon is a whole bunch of drops put together. A coulomb is the charge of a whole bunch of electrons put together. And so several of our electrical terms are not based on what's happening to a single electron, but what's happening to a group of electrons, a coulomb of charge. And the first term makes use of that electric potential difference, or voltage. When we were measuring voltage of our voltaic piles, our potato cells, and other um, electrochemical cells and batteries, we were measuring what's more properly known as the electric potential difference. It's the change in electric potential energy per unit charge. In a formula, we say potential difference is V, equals energy or work, W, divided by Q, which is charge. The unit that we use is the volt, named after Alexander Volta, who invented the first electrochemical battery. And one volt means the potential difference between two points, whether it's one side of a battery to another or one side of a light bulb to another, it says one joule of work or one joule of energy for each coulomb of charge. So you say, well, what, is, what exactly does that mean? One volt is one joule per coulomb. Well, we can look at it in a couple of ways. A one and a half volt dry cell says that each coulomb of charge that goes through this reaction gains one and a half joules of electric potential energy tells how much energy is gained. But if you measured the voltage of a light bulb, that would be how much electric potential energy in joules is lost by each Coulomb charge. So for electrons to go through a circuit element, they either give up energy to make it through there, or they gain energy, as in the case of a battery or a cell. We uh, normally relate this to regular old gravitational potential energy. This is a one kilogram mass, and if I raise it one meter, the work that I've done, 10 newtons of force times one meter gives me 10 joules of work to lift it, and it has now gained 
10 joules of gravitational potential energy. So anytime you move an object, a mass, against the gravitational field, it gains gravitational potential energy. But whenever you let it go with the gravitational field, it loses gravitational potential energy. The same thing happens with charge. Imagine this is an electron, and over here on this wall, it's negatively charged. So that negatively charged wall repels this electron. So it takes a force for me to push this electron closer to that wall. Well, if I measure that force times the distance, I get the work that I've done in pushing it. That work is equal to how much electric potential energy it gained. The volt says if I took 6.25 billion billion electrons and it took a joule of work to move them to that wall, there would be a one volt potential difference between where we started and where we ended up. So we measure voltage by putting the meter before and after our circuit element. We're comparing how much potential energy a coulomb of charge had before it went through that to how much it has after it comes out. That's what the volt tells us. So here's a diagram showing the meter connected across a light bulb. And you would measure the voltage across that light bulb the same way we measure the voltage across a battery by connecting it one side to the other. So we always measure potential difference or voltage across a circuit element. We put it on one side then the other. Voltage is comparing the electric potential energy of electrons after they leave a circuit element to what they had before they went into it. So our copper zinc potato cell was around 0.75 volts. That meant that each coulomb of charge that went through that chemical reaction gained 0.75 joules of electric potential energy. But remember, a coulomb of charge is 6.25 billion billion electrons. So 6.25 billion billion electrons, each individual electron's energy adds up to be 0.75 joules, means that each electron has a very tiny amount of energy. But because there are so many there, it adds up. So batteries and cells raise the potential energy, whereas other circuit elements take it away. The electrons have to give up energy to fight through that light bulb, to fight through that motor. So they're converting electric potential energy into light or heat or motion or sound. Our next term is electric current. Current is the flow of charge. Now, charge flow could be positive or it could be negative. Um, but when we're talking about wires and solid devices, solid things, it's usually the electrons that do the moving. So the protons are not moving. It is possible to have a liquid solution with positive ions in it that are flowing and generating or creating the current. But in our wires, it's always going to be the electrons. We measure the flow of charge. The unit that we use to measure the flow is called the amp, or the ampere, named after Andre Marie Ampere. And notice Ampere lived in that same late 1700s, early 1800s, as did many of our other famous electricians. So what is one amp of current? Well, one amp of current means one coulomb of charge flows past a point every single second. One coulomb of charge is 6.25 billion billion electrons go past a point every second. So if we have one amp of current flowing through this wire, that means at any point on the wire, 6.25 billion billion electrons go past there every second. Now you might think, wow, they gotta be going awfully darn fast to get that many past a point every second, 6.25 billion billion. Well, they would have to be going awfully darn fast if they were big. But electrons are so small, and there are so many in even a thin wire, 
that 6.25 billion billion is a small fraction and they're just drifting along together. In fact, the average drift velocity in normal wires is maybe a millimeter a second, which means it would take a thousand seconds for an electron to flow this far down a wire. A thousand seconds is almost 17 minutes. That's slow, not fast. The formula that we use for this, if, char if current is charge per time, we use an I for current equals charge Q divided by time T. I is Q over T. We always measure current through a circuit element. We don't put the meter on one side and the other side. We put the meter in line with it. The current that flows through this light bulb also flows through the meter. And so whatever is flowing through the meter, we know that's the same amount that's flowing through the light bulb. So we always put an ammeter in series or in line with our circuit element either right before or right after it to know what's going through that circuit element. It's measuring how many electrons pass by a given point every second. So if we had 3.25 amps of current, that means 3.25 coulombs of charge pass by the point every second. They enter and leave a point every second. Now remember if a coulomb is 6.25 billion billion electrons, then if it's 3.25 amps, we can measure, multiply that 3.25 by the 6.25 billion billion to know how many electrons are going past a given point every second. So the device that measures current is an ammeter. The device that measures potential difference is the volt voltmeter. These are pictures of analog meters that have a dial but when we're using our multimeters, they're digital, and um, we can click it to an ammeter setting, we can click it to a voltmeter setting. So they're a little more convenient, and they give us a decimal reading. Another term is electric power. Now, whenever we studied power earlier in the year, we knew that power is work divided by time, or energy divided by time, and we use the unit the watt to measure power. It was joules per second. It's the same thing for electricity. Electrical power is the time rate change in either converting electrical energy to other forms of energy, like light, heat, sound, or motion, or converting other forms of energy, like chemical energy, into electrical energy. So the rate at which that's done how many joules per second will give us the watts of power? Conveniently, if power is work divided by time, that ends up being volts times amps. P is V times I. Because the volt, or potential difference, is work per charge, the amp is charge over time, and when you multiply those together, the charges cancel, and you get work over time. So electrical power in watts is potential difference in volts times amps of current. V is VI. The power of an electrical circuit element, or of the whole circuit, tells us how many joules of electric potential energy are being converted into other forms of energy each second, or how many joules of some other type of energy are being converted into electrical energy each second. We're all familiar with light bulbs, 40 watt, 60 watt, 100 watt. Well, if you have a 60 watt light bulb, that means that 60 joules of energy are being converted every second. That's 60 joules of electric potential energy being converted into light or heat each second. Normally with light bulbs, we want the light and not the heat. So fluorescent bulbs give us more light, less heat, which means a fluorescent bulb can be about 15 watts to give us the same amount of light as a 60 watt bulb. So it costs about one fourth as much to operate. An LED is about one tenth of that. So a six watt LED can give us as much light as that 60 watt incandescent bulb. So LEDs are the most energy efficient. 
you have to buy that energy. It's not free. So you or someone you know is going to pay for how many joules of energy you use each month. That's what our electric bill is. Plus all these other surcharges and taxes and things that almost double your bill. The last term we want to look at is resistance. Resistance is what determines the amount of current flow. It's the ratio of potential difference to current. Resistance is potential difference divided by current. R is V over I. V is measured in volts. I is measured in amps. Volts over amps gives us the unit called the ohm of, of electrical resistance. Named after George Simon Ohm, who also lived through uh, to the mid-1800s. So what is an ohm of resistance? An ohm of resistance is the amount of resistance such that it would take one volt to give us one amp of current. Our batteries and power supplies are constant voltages. This is one and a half volts, and it doesn't matter what I connect it to. It's always going to be one and a half volts. But if you ask, how many amps of current does this produce, you can't answer that without knowing the resistance of what it's connected to. So this is one and a half volts. Well, how many amps will that give me? Well, it depends on the resistance of what I connect it to. So I could connect it to a certain resistance and get one amp. I could connect it to another resistance and only get 0.1 amps. This is a six volt lantern battery. It's always 6 volts. The amount of current that it produces depends on the resistance of what it's connected to. So it doesn't give us constant current. It gives us constant voltage. So the resistance in ohms of a circuit or of a circuit element tells us how many volts of potential difference are needed to produce an amp of current. So if we had a resistor that was 175 ohms, and a lot of our resistors are large numbers. That means that we would need 175 volts to get an amp of current. But if we only had a tenth of that, we would only get a tenth of an amp of current. So the more volts you put on it, the more current you're going to get. Resistance is volts divided by amps. Ohms is volts divided by amps. You can read more in depth about these terms and electric circuits at the physicsclassroom.com site. Lesson one is on electric potential difference, voltage. Lesson two is current, amps or amperage. Lesson three is resistance, that's measured in ohms. And then lesson four talks about different types of circuits.